Welcome everybody to the latest installment of our Emotional Wellbeing webinar series. I'm Amy Liepman, President of NTM Info and Research. I will be the moderator for this evening's session. Today's topic is common sleep issues and how to get better sleep. We're delighted to welcome back Dr. Devin Smith. Dr. Smith is a licensed clinical psychologist. Her professional background has involved researching and treating psychological factors unique to chronic illness and health concerns. She has worked in a variety of medical settings, including oncology, primary care, cardiology, pulmonology, infectious disease, sleep medicine, and NTM-related clinics. Currently, she is an assistant professor at National Jewish Health in Denver, Colorado. Dr. Smith, welcome back. We're delighted to have you. For today's session, if you have a question, type it into the Q&A box. If you want to send it anonymously, you check that little box that says send anonymously. And once you're done, you hit send. The questions will queue up, and after the presenter is done, I will read out the questions so that we can answer them. We'd like to thank all of our supporters. InsMed has been our one, a wonderful supporter of all of our programming over the last two years, and without support from them and people like you, we couldn't bring this wonderful programming to you. We've been delighted to do this for the last two years and look forward to doing this again next year. Don't forget to follow us on social media. We're on uh, Instagram, Facebook. Twitter and LinkedIn. And if you need to get the latest news delivered right to your email box, go to ntminfo.org and sign up for the latest news. If you've missed any of our previous webinars, you can go to our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash NTMIR. All of our webinars are archived there and all of our previous conferences as well. So you can catch up on them at any time. Dr. Smith, thank you so much. We're delighted to have you. The floor is yours. Thanks, Amy. All right, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Can you, can you see that okay? Yes, we can. Perfect. Thank you. Well, thank you everyone for coming tonight. So I'm going to talk about sleep uh, this evening. I spoke about it, I think it was a year ago now. Um, I gave a presentation on insomnia and some uh, treatment tips and techniques for dealing with sleep issues. And so I'm gonna elaborate a bit on that more tonight. Um, the goal is to briefly go over insomnia. Um, some of what I, I covered last time, just a recap um, about what insomnia is and what causes it. But what I wanna elaborate on a bit is some other sleep issues that I haven't touched on um, in my past webinar. So specifically something called a circadian rhythm disorder, sleep apnea, restless leg syndrome, uh, periodic limb movement disorder. So these are other common sleep issues that I see in my sleep clinic. Um, and a lot of them, or some of them involve medical treatments, not just psychological, but I wanna to touch on them tonight. And then we'll talk about treatments. And then if we have time, I'm gonna get into some tips and techniques that I discussed last time. But if, if we don't get to it, cause I wanna leave plenty of time for questions. Um, like Amy mentioned, that link is available for um, past webinars on YouTube, and I, that presentation should be on there. So just a recap of what insomnia is for those of you that weren't in the webinar or for people that don't remember. Um, insomnia at it, its most basic is just dissatisfaction with sleep quantity or quality. And so it can be either difficulty falling asleep, it can be uh, trouble staying asleep, so waking up in the middle of the night and being awake for a while, not being able to fall back to sleep easily, um, and then waking up too early and not being able to go back to sleep. So those are some common issues, and it, it could also just be the quality. So someone that may or may not sleep enough, but it just feels uh, like disrupted sleep, um, poor sleep quality, so that can be insomnia as well. And so insomnia as a disorder for a diagnosis, it has to cause distress uh, or impairment. And so um, you have to be either worried about the fact that you're having sleep issues or it has to be interfering with your daytime functioning in some sense. Um, so some common issues I see in the sleep clinic where I work, um, you know, is fatigue or low energy, um, mood problems, depression, anxiety, irritability, uh, difficulty concentrating, um, paying attention, that's certainly an issue when you're not sleeping well. Um, and, and for an insomnia diagnosis, it's not just a night or two of poor sleep, it has to be three or more uh, nights per week for a consistent amount of time, so for three more months or more. So a lot of Americans, I forget the exact statistic, but a, a staggeringly high amount of Americans have uh, one to two 
four uh, nights of sleep a week. But that not, isn't necessarily an insomnia diagnosis, but that doesn't mean that there aren't ways you can improve your sleep. Um, I want to talk briefly about some processes that are involved in sleep, um, just because it's going to relate in when I talk about treatments later on, and it's also going to relate to some of the other sleep issues that I talk about tonight. So when we talk about regulating sleep, and this is important to insomnia because these are the, the processes that um, may be disrupted when we have insomnia. The first one here is called the sleep drive. And so the way I like to think of sleep drive is like hunger. In theory, the longer you go without food, the more you need it. The same thing with sleep drive. In theory, the longer you go without sleep, the more you need it, the higher your sleep drive is. And so when someone wakes up for the day, um, in theory, their sleep drive is reset because they just slept the night before. For people that are having trouble sleeping, um, you know, their sleep drive might not be totally reset when they wake up in the morning, but still it builds throughout the day. So a chemical called adenosine builds in the body throughout the day that increases this sleepiness or this need for sleep. And so when the nighttime comes, you really have to have a good dose of this built up to be able to first fall asleep and to stay asleep. So some issues that I see, um, for example, is um, someone who might be taking long, regular naps in the middle of the day. Uh, well, that's burning off a chunk of your sleep drive. And so particularly if you're having difficulty with nighttime sleep, that might be something worth modifying because you're not, you don't have the right amount of sleep drive built up if you burn off a chunk of it during the day. Um, that's not necessarily the case, though, if you're uh, dealing with an illness that's uh, requiring you to sleep more. So if you're sleeping okay at night and you're taking naps during the day because your body needs more sleep, that's not necessarily an issue. Um, really, the naps become an issue if it's disrupting your sleep at night and that's a problem for you. Uh, but the other process that's involved with sleep is called the circadian clock. And so we're going to talk a lot more about this when I talk about circadian rhythm disorders. But this is involved in the timing of our sleep. So this, you can sort of think of this as a way to offset the sleep drive, um, but it, it controls the timing of our sleep so that when we wake up in the morning, uh, our melatonin is turned off, so to speak. And so the longer we go without that circulating in our body, the more and more awake we are. Until nighttime comes, melatonin is released again and our wakefulness decreases. And so the important part to re remember with this is that um, <clears throat> the circadian clock isn't necessarily pre-programmed. We may be born with certain predispositions to be a morning or night person, but it is trained by our environment. And so when it's well-trained, it allows our body to know when to be asleep and when to be awake. So one of the main things with this is that the circadian clock lives in this little part of the brain called the hypothalamus, um, which is connected to the eyes um, through the optic nerve. So light is really important for training the circadian clock. That's why when um, there's the, the clock change, sometimes sleep can be disrupted because the timing of the light is changed, um, which disrupts our sleep, uh, that internal clock. So morning light is really important to stabilizing this clock. And so that's one thing that that I'll talk about as a tip is to get a regular dose of morning sunlight around the same time every day. Um, and this doesn't have to be standing outside. It can just be going into a, a brighter area of your house, but that can help regulate that internal clock. So you can kind of see how these two offset each other so that as sleep drive builds, we're able to stay awake through the day. Um, and then once we build up a good dose, we're able to fall asleep at night and burn off that sleep drive. But a third process that can interfere with sleep, especially when we're talking about insomnia, is this excessive arousal. So if you have too much arousal, either mentally or physically, when you're trying to sleep, it's going to make it very difficult. Um, this can be things like trouble relaxing your body, difficulty shutting off your mind at night. Um, it's going to impair your sleep, even if you have a great sleep drive and your circadian clock is well trained. So these are factors that we look at, um, especially from a psychological perspective or a behavioral health perspective when we're trying to um, treat insomnia. So often we're trying to make sure that you have enough sleep drive built up, that your circadian clock is well-trained, and that you don't have too much mental or physical arousal that could be blocking your sleep. And so, like I said, I'll talk more about these factors and how you can improve them, but I just wanted to lay that groundwork now. 
A quick note that I always like to make about sleep is that our sleep needs do change as we age. Um, so as we age, we just don't sleep as long or as deep. And that's not necessarily um, considered abnormal. It's part of the normal age-related sleep changes. So in about middle age, there's a drop in deep sleep and there's more frequent nighttime awakenings. And so um, really all that means is that we have to change our expectations about how we schedule sleep as we age. And so sometimes in my sleep clinic, I'll see people, you know, 50, 60, 70 years old that are hoping to sleep eight to nine hours a night, and it's likely not going to happen as we age. So you can see here in the sleep recommendations, um, you know, for an adult 26 to 64, seven to nine hours is about the average or the recommendation. Although some people, you know, it might be okay to sleep as little as six or as much as 10. And then over 65, it changes again. You know, now it's even lower, that seven to eight hour range. Um, five to six might be okay. And then as much as nine. So that, that does just show you that these sleep changes do occur. And again, it's not necessarily the case if you're um, dealing with physical illness, because sometimes you do need more sleep and that's not necessarily factored into this uh, graph here. So overall, what we think of when we think of insomnia, at least from a behavioral health standpoint, um, which is you know where I come from with my clinic, um, helping people with insomnia, uh, so unhelpful sleep beliefs in this model uh, underlies a lot of the issues that we have with sleep. I'm not going to get too much into it, but these are beliefs that are usually very strongly held that are impacting how you address your sleep. So a common example is, you know, someone that has a belief that they're going to get dementia or Alzheimer's because their sleep is impaired. Um, now, whether or not that's true isn't the case, because of course there is research out there that links you know, not enough sleep with cognitive decline. It's more about is this helping your sleep or is it hurting your sleep? Because anytime you place a lot of pressure on your sleep, it's gonna make it very difficult to sleep. So if someone's laying in bed at night thinking about Alzheimer's or dementia, or thinking about the consequences of not falling asleep, it's placing a lot of pressure on the ability to fall asleep, likely increasing that arousal level and making it very difficult to fall asleep. So that's one example of an unhelpful sleep belief, but where it feeds into the behaviors and these processes, let's say someone didn't sleep well one night, they slept you know, four hours because they just couldn't fall asleep, couldn't stay asleep. That next day, if they have the time and ability to do so, they might take a two, three hour nap to catch up on some of that sleep um, you know, with that belief that, okay, well, I just need to get this right amount of sleep. Well, now it's going to lower their sleep drive for the next night, and it's going to keep this insomnia around. So you can kind of see how these are all linked together. Um, and there's some other factors that lead into these processes that can interfere with sleep or um, uh, maintain that insomnia cycle. One is too much time in bed, um, and that's time in bed sleep, uh, not sleeping. So often there's a mismatch between what someone wants to sleep and what they're actually sleeping. So if you're hoping to sleep eight hours a night and you plan to be in bed from 11 to seven, but you're only sleeping a portion of that, you know, now you're spending a lot of time in bed that, that you're actually awake, you're not asleep. And so there's this mismatch and that's something that can be addressed. Variable sleep schedules, um, of course, that leads into that uh, poorly trained circadian clock, which kind of keeps us in a constant state of jet lag. If that's not something that's trained or, um, or programmed in us, well, our body doesn't know when to be awake and when to be asleep. So sleeping in, staying up late, going to bed early, kind of keeping this variable sleep schedule um, is probably going to keep your sleep disrupted. And then there's some factors here that can lead to excessive uh, bedtime arousal, such as performance anxiety. Um, so people can develop almost straight stage fright about the ability to sleep. You know, the more problems you have with sleep, the more you worry about it at night. Um, and that can actually wake you up and make it hard to sleep in and of itself. Sometimes there's something called conditioned arousal. And so this is where um, you basically repeatedly pair unsuccessful attempts with sleep with the bed. And pretty soon, all you have to do is get in bed and you're awake. So this is really common um, if I see people that are just dozing on the couch. They're so sleepy. They get in bed and then they're wide awake. And it's kind of this what the heck moment of why am I awake when I was just very sleepy. 
Um, and that's often because you've conditioned yourself to be awake in bed. And so there's some things you can do about that. Um, attentional bias. So this is just the tendency to focus more on sleep um, and trying to sleep, which causes this excessive arousal, makes it hard to sleep. People without sleep issues, they don't really try to do it. They just do it. And so the more focus you put on it, the more you try to force it, the harder it becomes. And then sometimes just an active mind can keep you up at night. So just thinking. Sometimes it's worrying, but sometimes it's just thinking about all different sorts of things. But if you can't shut your mind off, it's hard to sleep. And so these are all factors that can interfere with sleep. But insomnia can also be a secondary issue um, related to some other sleep concerns. So it can actually be a symptom as well as an actual disorder. And so when you see insomnia as a symptom, um, often it's related to some of these other uh, issues that I want to talk about. And so one of these is called a circadian rhythm disorder. So this is actually a class of issues. Um, there's different types. But at its most basic, it's a misalignment with the body's internal clock, so that circadian internal biological clock, and a person's external environment um, or their desired sleep and wake time. So it's this mismatch between our internal clock and what we call the social clock um, or what dictates our life, whether it's medical appointments, work, social obligations, um, you know, the timing of our sleep isn't matching up with that. Or someone that really wants to, you know, um, be awake by a certain time, but just can't be, um, you know, these are more issues with the circadian rhythm um, process. So this is something, again, that's persistent and recurrent. You'll see that with most of these. It's not just a night or two where this is an issue. It's something that's more persistent. Um, and often with these types of disorders, you see improved sleep quality and duration if someone's allowed to follow their natural sleep schedule. So for instance, I'll talk about a delayed sleep-wake phase where the circadian rhythm is just delayed. So if these people are able to follow their natural schedule, you know, what, you know 4 a.m. to 12 p.m., they sleep fine. They don't have any issues falling asleep, more or less can stay asleep. Really, it becomes an issue, though, when they're trying to go to sleep earlier. Um, or if they have to wake up earlier. So it, it's really when you're um, not following that schedule that your body's trying to dictate that you might have some issues that seem like insomnia. Um, so symptoms can impl include insomnia, so difficulty falling or staying asleep, um, particularly if you're not following that natural clock, as well as uh, um, some daytime sleepiness, or and you have to have distress or impairment. Um, so for it to be a disorder, just in general, for a diagnostic perspective, everything has to either cause you a lot of distress or impair your life in some way. If someone chooses to follow a delayed schedule and it's no problem, it's not interfering with their life, they're not worried about it, it's not necessarily a disorder. It's just a circadian rhythm pattern. Um, so for it to be a disorder, it has to be causing some disruption. And so under this circadian rhythm disorder umbrella, one specific type is called a delayed sleep-wake phase. And it's just like it sounds, everything's just delayed. Um, so delayed in the timing of uh, the major sleep period, usually by more than two hours. So when I see someone with a delayed circadian rhythm disorder, typically they're people that are falling asleep three, four, five, six a.m. So it's, it's really significantly later. It's not someone that's falling asleep really at like 1 a.m. or something. That might be a, a slight, uh, we call it a nocturnal predisposition. So you're more, um, you know, you might be more prone to staying up later, but it's really not truly delayed until it's, it's much later than that. So like three, four, five a.m. Um, and so everything's just delayed, sleep onset, so when you fall asleep and when you wake up, and it's hard to follow, you know, a conventional or desired uh, schedule. So like I said, when you're able to set your own schedule, it's fine, um, but you often experience a lack of sleep with obligations that require waking earlier. So a lot of people that I see with the delayed circadian rhythm disorder, um, they're sleep deprived pretty much all week if they work um, because and their work schedule requires them to be up at a certain time because it's not like you can switch between two schedules very easily um, specific off, mainly if you have a circadian rhythm disorder but for most people it's hard to maintain two different schedules and so they're you know might not be able to fall asleep till 3 a.m but they have to be up at six so then every day you know of the week 
the work week, they're getting three hours of sleep. And then it's really hard not to overcorrect that on the weekend. And then it just keeps the cycle going. So it's a really, um, it, it's not a, a fun position for people to be in, um, particularly when they can't alter their schedule. Um, a lot of these people are considered night owls. So that some, you know, they might say they've always kind of been a night owl. They've always uh, preferred being awake later. They feel more energized later. Uh, we see this more in adolescents, um, and there might be a family history of delayed sleep um, that we see. So, you know, someone's parents were night owls or their siblings. So it, it can definitely have a genetic component. Um, yeah, and so that's that's pretty much the delayed part. The opposite side of that is what we call advanced sleep-wake phase. And so this is basically the opposite of delayed. Um, so this is where a person tends to fall asleep and wake up much earlier than they desi than desired or, um, you know, earlier than socially acceptable. So, you know, this is a person that's falling asleep, you know, two hours or so before. So it might be a person, you know, uh, going to sleep at 7 p.m. and waking up, you know, at 2 or 3 a.m. And so it's shifted forward. And so it's hard for this person to remain awake until they you know, want to go to sleep. If they're trying to push it to a later bedtime, it's hard for them. Um, but the unfortunate thing is when they are required to delay their bedtime, you know, for whatever reason, it's then hard to sleep later. You know, they're still going to wake up at that earlier time because that's what their body schedule is wanting them to do. And so often that can just lead to sleep loss. Um, Interestingly, with both of these, the timing of certain biomarks involved in the circadian rhythm, um, they're altered a bit. So, uh, for instance, melatonin in this case is released earlier than normal. So it's hard, you, you know, your body's preparing for sleep earlier than maybe some other people. Uh, we see this a lot in older age groups. Um, and so this is something that can happen um, as we age. But of course, it, again, it's really not an issue unless it's causing impairment in your life in some way. So there's a number of other circadian rhythm disorders that fall under that umbrella, but those are the two main ones that um, are probably the most commonly seen. And so the treatment for these types of disorders really depends on the particular diagnosis. So whether it's advanced, delayed, or one of the other types, um, but a lot of times it, there's an emphasis on what we call good sleep hygiene, which I'll talk about later. So they're just practices that um, kind of keep your sleep healthy. Um, and then a consistent sleep-wake schedule. So a lot of circadian rhythm disorders uh, really need to uh, follow this consistent sleep-wake schedule that has, usually has to be the same every day. So it's quite tricky to treat. Um, it, it's possible, but it's hard to realign your natural clock um, and you have to be pretty strict with it. So it might involve taking melatonin a couple of hours before bed, especially for people that have a more delayed pattern. This can be a helpful type of treatment is taking a very low dose of melatonin two, three hours before bed. Um, a common misconception with melatonin is it's not necessarily a sleep aid in the common sense or in the traditional sense. Um, it's not going to put you to sleep. If you take it right before bed, it's not going to just make you sleepy and put you out. Some people say it does, and if it does for you, great. Um, but the way it's it's designed to work is to take, you know, before bedtime to prepare your body for sleep once it does, um, basically alters the timing of your sleep a bit. So that's something that can be done for a delayed sleep schedule. And then exposure to light, because light does set our uh, sleep schedule or our internal sleep clock. Uh, light exposure upon awakening in the morning for that delayed schedule can be helpful. Um, if it's advanced, if you're trying to stay up later, it can actually be helpful to get some light, even artificial light, um, in the late afternoon, early evening to delay that sleep time. Whenever it's possible, if it's not entirely flipped. So there are health consequences of following a completely flipped schedule where you're going to sleep at you know, 7 a.m. and waking up at, you know, 8, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., for instance, and then you're not getting any daylight hours. And there could be some health consequences with that. Of course, some people have to do it for their job, but that's not the most ideal situation. But if your body's just a little bit delayed um, or advanced in one direction or the other, if you have the ability to follow that natural rhythm, it's a lot easier than trying to shift it. So sometimes I'll work with people, um, 
uh, who have recently retired um, and they're finding they're going to sleep later and waking up later and it's not really causing them impairment. Um, they're still able to do what they want to do, but they have this feeling like they're being lazy because they're sleeping in. And so sometimes what I'll recommend is, you know, it's not lazy if that's just your, your natural sleep schedule and you have the ability to follow it. It's not disrupting your life. Sometimes it's easier to follow that, you know, uh, 2 a.m. to 10 a.m. kind of schedule than to try to reset it entirely. It's not impossible, but you have to be quite strict. And it's like a rubber band. The second you let go, it's going to snap back. So with retraining your clock with these circadian rhythm disorders, it involves a lot of discipline. So just something to consider. Uh, not that it's impossible, just requires uh, a significant portion of work. So the other type of sleep issue that I want to talk about is sleep apnea. So some of you may have heard of this before, but it's an abnormal breathing pattern during sleep. So uh, it's repeated reductions or pauses in breathing for brief periods um, while you're asleep. And so these lapses, they can cause you to awaken, uh, awaken periodically through the night. Um, it, it more commonly reduces sleep quality. So someone with sleep, untreated sleep apnea might sleep eight, nine hours, but they wake up exhausted. You know, that's common for people with sleep apnea. Um, there's a misconception out there that if you have sleep apnea, you have breathing issues while you're sleeping, you're going to wake up consistently throughout the night. But that actually isn't the case. A lot of times it's just um, disrupting us from uh, some of the deeper stages of sleep to lighter stages, so over and over again, which is impairing the quality, but you're not fully waking up, you're not totally aware of it, um, so you might not be aware that your breathing pattern is abnormal. So there's two different types of apnea. The main one I'm going to talk about today is obstructive sleep apnea, or OSA, um, and this is where the back of the throat is constricted while you're breathing, or while you're trying to breathe, so it's blocked. Um, it can cause snoring, but really it just prevents air from passing um, into the lungs normally. So you can see in this picture, um, what happens is back here, the throat collapses a bit, and so you're not able to get air into your lungs. And so what this can look like is a person might wake up, um, might not wake up fully, but often you can see their throat muscles engaging, like trying to open that airway. Um, gasping or taking deep breaths. Sometimes it's a snorting sound or a slight choking sound. Um, if someone's sharing the bed with you, they might notice that. It's the most common type of sleep apnea, um, estimated to affect uh, anywhere from 10 to 30 percent of adults in the U.S., but it's often undiagnosed. Um, there is another type of sleep apnea called central sleep apnea, and so this is a bit different. It's not uh, blocking the airway passage necessarily. It's more um, communication between the brain and the muscle that controls our breathing. So it's not anything is blocked. We're just not getting the signal to take a breath. And so in this situation, breathing is often shallow. There might be temporary pauses. Um, but like I said, I'm going to focus more on the OSA today. So some symptoms that you can see with obstructive sleep apnea is daytime sleepiness. Um, and so excessive daytime sleepiness, you might have trouble staying awake, um, you might be dozing throughout the day, uh, and this is really because the sleep quality is so poor if you're not breathing properly. Uh, there can sometimes be loud snoring with gasping or choking, but not always. Um, a lot of times I'll see people that say, you know, oh, I don't snore, like I wouldn't have sleep apnea. And you don't have to be a loud snorer to necessarily have sleep apnea. Um, headaches in the morning that can persist for several hours after waking up, that can be common with sleep apnea, dry mouth after um, waking, uh, periods of restlessness um, with wakefulness while you're sleeping. Uh, interestingly, uh, untreated sleep apnea has been related to increased urine production, and so sometimes uh, you, you might have to get up a lot to go to the bathroom in the night if you have sleep apnea. Um, of course, a lot of these symptoms, though, can be caused by many different things. So that's why we don't diagnose this condition just based on symptoms. You have to have a sleep study, which I'll talk about in order to diagnose this. But these are just things to look out for, um, especially if you feel like your sleep quality is off. Um, these might be uh, symptoms that something is you know, going on with the breathing while you're trying to sleep. So there's some risk factors associated with sleep apnea. Um, 
the risk of uh, OSA increases with age. Um, men or uh, people assigned male at birth are more likely uh, to have sleep apnea, especially in the earlier stages of adulthood. By the middle or late stages of adulthood, it, that difference kind of goes away. Um, head and neck anatomy. So a lot of times people that have sleep apnea, it's purely anatomy. It might not be anything like weight. I know a lot of times people hear that um, weight is associated with sleep apnea, and, and it is, but there's other features as well. People can be very small and have sleep apnea, which shocks a lot of people that I see. Um, if you have a small airway, if it's crowded, you have a large tongue, certain builds of your jaw, it just makes it so that when you sleep, a tiny little shift closes your airway. So sometimes it's the anatomy um, that can, can impact sleep apnea. Uh, family history of sleep apnea can increase your risk. Some of that might be because of the anatomical features that are passed down among family members. Uh, nasal congestion, certain medical conditions can put you at higher risk. Interestingly, I read some research that um, patients with bronchiectasis uh, might be uh, uh, frequency of OSA in bronchiectasis found anywhere from 40 to 60 percent. So. Um, you know, there could be with certain lung conditions an increased risk of sleep apnea. Um, and then I know I said we're talking about obstructive sleep apnea, but it, just a brief mention for central sleep apnea. If you've been on opioids for a long time for pain management, for instance, that puts you at risk of developing uh, uh, central sleep apnea. So that's uh, commonly something I see physicians testing for. If you've been on opioids for a long time, it's a good idea to have a sleep study. Um, being at higher altitude can impact central sleep apnea um, for reasons I won't get into, but if you move from a lower elevation to a higher elevation area and you're having sleep issues, it might regulate over time, but it's something that can impact your sleep. And so in order to diagnose sleep apnea, you need what's called a sleep study. And so these can be done either in a lab where you go to a sleep lab and you spend the night there all connected to things. It's super fun. Um, or these can be done at home where you bring uh, different equipment home and you connect it to yourself, sleep with it, and then return it to the clinic. And which type of test uh, or evaluation you do often depends on what your doctor recommends. There's um, different situations that require different types of testing. Um, and so some treatments for sleep apnea, the most common one is what we call positive airway pressure um, devices or PAP. So you might have heard of a CPAP before, that's one of them. Um, but it basically keeps the airway open with pressurized air. So it, it kind of shoots air into your airway to keep it open throughout the night. Um, this is an example of what one can look like. Um, they're very advanced these days. So even from five years ago, they're much better. They're very small machines. They're very quiet. There's so many different options for um, the headgear that you wear. There's um, different fits. A lot of times their hoses are on the top now and they swivel so you can, you know, toss and turn during the night and it doesn't necessarily wrap around you. So there's been a lot of advances. Um, you know, I'm not going to lie. Some people it does take some getting used to, but it's not something that, um, is as disruptive, I think, as it used to be. So sometimes an oral appliance made by a dentist can be an option. I always recommend that you really ask some questions of if you see a dentist and you're, you're considering this option, ask, you know, why you're a candidate, what makes them think this would be successful for you? Because unfortunately, it's not successful for everyone and it costs a couple thousand dollars or more and it's often not covered by insurance. So just really making sure that you're, because most often it's the anatomy that um, it might be helping. And so if you're a good candidate for that, I would really be asking some questions. Um, and there are some surgical options um, that could apply, but usually these are not the first line of recommended treatment. It's easiest to just start with a PAP. You can always try it if you have insurance and then give it back if it doesn't work. Um, but it, it, it's the easiest and um, most common first option, I believe. So um, there's all sorts of reasons why treating sleep apnea is important, especially if you're at moderate or severe levels of sleep apnea. Um, you're at risk for a lot of different uh, health conditions. So treating it is pretty important, um, particularly if it's a more severe level of apnea. So the last type of sleep issue that I want to talk about today is restless leg or periodic limb movement disorder. 
And so these have similar symptoms and they often occur together, but they're, they're a little bit different. So with restless leg syndrome, what you see is uh, discomfort in your legs, often described as um, discomfort, tingling, burning. Sometimes people describe it to me as like a crawling feeling in their leg, um, aching, itching. Sometimes legs feel itchy. Um, I had someone describe it to me as like just a straight shot of caffeine directly into their legs. So it's this really discomfort, restless type feeling um, that can show up in a couple of different ways. It's typically not described as muscle cramps or numbness. Usually that, that might be something else. Um, and it's typically just at night or in the later hours of the evening. It, it can be at different times, but it might, it is most commonly seen, you know, right before bed or during when you're trying to sleep. Um, and so with restless leg, you have an urge to move. And so sometimes that movement, like stretching or um, pacing, walking, uh, jiggling your legs, it can relieve these symptoms, but it's temporary. It's not like it solves the issue entirely. Um, and this can actually be related to sleep apnea. So sometimes um, doing a sleep study first to see if you have any underlying apnea could also treat any restless leg issues um, if it is related to the apnea. Uh, and also it can be related to low iron. So that's also another common test if you're having um, discomfort in your legs like that at night to test your iron levels, um, because that can be an easy fix. But if that's low, you can take a supplement. Uh, another, so the periodic limb movement is similar in that there is this discomfort in your legs, but it's really during sleep. So someone's moving a lot in their sleep. They're tossing, they're turning, they're kicking, their arms are flailing. Um, and so it, it's a certain uh, number of arousals by moving a lot at night. Um, and so commonly people that have this type of issue, you know, their sheets are like pulled off their bed the next morning. Um, you know, someone says they kick a lot in their sleep. Um, this might be uh, indicative of this periodic limb movement disorder. So it can cause some daytime drowsiness, um, but often it goes undetected. You're not really aware of these movements at night. Um, it's not, it's different than like acting out dreams. Sometimes I have people say like, well, I, you know, kick and punch in my dreams or I talk or it, it's different than that. It's just like small leg movements um, or arm movements. And so you're not entirely aware of them when they're happening. Usually it's someone else that's aware of it or you're feeling it the next day. Like you just haven't gotten good sleep. Um, RLS can lead to periodic limb movement disorder. So sometimes you see the two together. And so to get this diagnosis, you'd have to have a discussion with a medical provider and maybe have a sleep study to rule out anything else that might be causing these issues. Um, but there are some treatments that you can, uh, there are ways to treat this. So um, sometimes supplements, um, there's been some research to suggest magnesium could be helpful. If your iron levels are low, treating that. Um, there are prescription medications, but sometimes people recommend starting out with maybe some home remedies to see if some of these other options would help. So soaking legs in warm water, massaging legs, alternating between heat and cold. So ice packs and heating pads, exercise. Um, importantly, you don't want it to be too vigorous too late in the day because that can actually worsen these symptoms. Um, there's foot wraps or vibrating pads that are designed for this. Um, try not to resist movement. So if you feel like your legs need to move, it can actually be helpful to stretch before bed. Um, so it says beginning and ending the day with some stretching can be helpful, um, limiting certain stimulants that can make this worse, like alcohol, caffeine, nicotine, um, and then talking to your provider about your medication list and seeing if any of them could be interfering with this, because there are certain medications um, that can make these symptoms worse. It might not be about getting off of a medication, um, but it might be helpful to know if you're experiencing this as a side effect. And so I quickly went through a lot of information, but I'm going to try to leave you all with some suggestions for how you could maybe behaviorally treat some sleep issues. Um, one of the best or one of the most recommended treatments for insomnia is called cognitive behavioral, in cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia or CBTI, which is what I provide in the sleep clinic. And so it's it treats a lot of these underlying factors of chronic insomnia through skill building. So um, looking at behaviors and, and thoughts that might 
um, that you might have developed to help with the loss of sleep, but are actually hurting your sleep in the long term. Um, it's, you know, a short term treatment. It's not something that you sign up for forever. You know, it's four to, four to eight sessions every two to four weeks. And then, you know, you can manage this on your own. But I always like to highlight that, you know, this can be effective for insomnia that co-occurs with other sleep disorders like sleep apnea, but it's not going to treat the sleep apnea. So if you're not breathing properly at night and you're not sleeping well, you know, we might be able to do some of this and improve your sleep a little bit, but you're probably going to need to treat the breathing issues as well. Um, so you still need to be evaluated if there's, if you suspect that there's something else going on and treated. So um, oftentimes CBT is in addition to other uh, treatments if you have some of these other underlying issues. So when we talk about sleep hygiene, like I said, it's habits that can help you have a good night's sleep. And so you've probably heard a lot of these before. Most people have gotten a handout from their doctor or their primary care physician about how to get good sleep, or they've read it in an article. And so if you're not having, if you're just having some intermittent sleep issues, it's not super consistent, not a very uh, distressing concern. These sleep hygiene tips might be helpful, but sleep hygiene, on its own isn't going to treat a, an insomnia diagnosis. So it's more than just sleep hygiene to treat that. So I always like to say that because, you know, if you've followed, you, you've implemented these things and you're still having sleep issues, that's actually not, uh, that, that doesn't surprise me because this alone research shows doesn't treat um, insomnia. But, you know, some things like going to bed and getting up at the same time every day, um, exercising regularly, um, keeping the bedroom cool, dark, quiet, all that good stuff can be helpful. Um, if you take naps, keeping them short and before 5 p.m., again, this is if you're having sleep issues and you're not sick. If you need more naps because you're sick and you're able to sleep at night, that's a different story. Um, sometimes what I talk with about, uh, what I talk to people about is noticing the difference between fatigue and sleepiness. And so fatigue can occur commonly with insomnia and other conditions where you're just tired, you're run down, you're low energy, um, but you're not necessarily dozing off. You're not having trouble keeping your eyes open. If you laid down, you wouldn't necessarily fall asleep. That's more fatigue, where sleepiness is you're fighting off sleep. You know, if you've ever done like the slow blink, like you're just fighting it off, or you know you're so sleepy that you could lay down and fall asleep. That's sleepiness. So when you're considering a nap, really trying to determine if you're fatigued or if you're sleepy, because the nap is probably going to be most helpful if you're sleepy, but not so much if you're just fatigued. Um, there's a really great app that called Insomnia Coach. It was developed by the VA. It's completely free, but it's a self, uh, self-guided self approach to CBTI. So if you don't have, a, you know, the ability to see someone to do CBTI with, this can be a good option to start with. Um, it'll walk you through a training plan. You track your sleep. It'll give you recommendations. Um, but one of those things that's most helpful to start with is to set a sleep schedule. So um, setting an earliest bedtime and a latest wake time and following it every day of the week. So like I talked about with the circadian rhythm disorders, regularity is really important. Um, and so you really want to uh, keep your schedule close to what your actual sleep is. So for instance, I, I, uh, one of my patients today that I'm working with on sleep, um, you know, he's trying to go to bed at 10 and he really wants to go to sleep at 10. But when you look at when he's actually falling asleep, it's closer to 12 or 1230. So that's two, two and a half hours where he's trying to sleep, but he's not. And so that's when I, you know, we recommended you know, we set a bedtime of 1130, which is an hour and a half later than what he's doing, which sounds really counterintuitive, because if you're wanting more sleep, why wouldn't you go to bed earlier? But you have to start where you're at. So oftentimes, I'll recommend first solution is maybe to delay your bedtime a bit. Um, go to sleep, go to bed closer to when you're actually falling asleep, not when you want to be asleep. And you can work backwards. But first, you have to start where you are. Um, don't compensate for missed sleep. So if you can help it, you know, not sleeping in after a bad night, still waking up at that same time, getting that dose of sunlight, and then staying up until your bedtime the next night. Um, but after doing that a night or two, your sleep will start to regulate. Uh, another recommendation is 
to decrease time in bed where you're not sleeping. Um, and so I talked about this with the uh, conditioned arousal. Um, but basically what can happen is we can condition ourselves to be awake in the bed. So if you've ever heard of Pavlov's dog, it was an experiment back in the 1800s um, where uh, the experimenter would give the dog food, the dog would drool, they'd ring a bell, the dog wouldn't do anything. But when they paired the two together, um, you could train the dog to drool just at the sound of a bell. So pretty soon they wouldn't have to present the food, just the sound of the bell would associate uh, the dog would associate it with food and would drool. Same thing can happen with us in the bed. So if we are frustrated, anxious, just wide awake or struggling, um, we're not gonna sleep. It's gonna keep us awake. So if you pair that negative state enough with the bed, pretty soon you're just gonna get in bed and you're gonna be awake. It doesn't matter if you're frustrated, anxious, it's just the bed is now a place where you're awake. And so what you have to do in this situation is try to limit uh, what we call sleep incompatible behaviors. So getting out of the bed when you can't sleep. You know, if it's been 20 minutes or so and you're still wide awake, what do what I call a reset. Get out of bed for 10 minutes, maybe read a book, do a little, some, listen to a podcast, something stimulating enough that you're not out there sitting about how, sit, stewing about how you're not asleep, um, but not so stimulating that you're not gonna be able to go back to sleep. Um, so this isn't a time where you wanna read the news, get on social media, do chores. None of that is good during these reset times. Um, just something engaging, but not too stimulating until you can get back in bed. Um, you don't have to be up for a long time. You just wanna kind of cut that response where you're laying in bed trying to force sleep or you're tossing, turning frustrated um, because that's how you're gonna decondition yourself is to remove yourself from the bed when you're not sleeping. Uh, similarly, in the beginning of the night, you don't want to be doing a lot in bed before you start uh, your sleep attempt. So uh, if you're someone that likes to read in bed, watch TV in bed, try to try to either cut that out or uh, minimize it as much as you can. And so some people tell me they really need to read for a little bit to just that's a cue for them to get sleepy and go to sleep. Sure, but keep it to 15, 20 minutes. Don't get in bed two hours earlier than you want to sleep or that you normally fall asleep and read. Um, you know, maybe start the reading outside of the bed, come to the bed, read for 15 minutes, put the book down, sleep attempt. Um, so you basically really don't want to be doing anything in bed other than sleep. So I'm going to skip some of these active mind recommendations, not that they're not important, but um, I want to leave time for questions. And I do cover them, like I said, in that other webinar that I gave last year. Um, so you can definitely uh, tune into that. I have a lot more of those suggestions in that webinar. Um, but like I said, I, I want to leave time for questions if there are any. Okay, well, um, <clears throat> I think we have two in the in the queue to start. So mm -hmm. we'll start with those. The first one is they're asking about safe medication or herbal alternatives to take as needed during the night when sleep eludes. Yeah, so uh, safe medication. Um, so I would definitely talk to your, your physician or your medical team about that because there are some safer medications that are indicated for lo longer term use. So you don't have to use them every night. Um, typically they don't recommend things like Ambien or Lunesta super long term, um, just because there can be some downsides to that. But there's medications, um, like there's some antidepressants that actually cause sleepiness and there are newer medications that are more effective for anxiety and depression but these medications are now used mainly for insomnia because of that side effect of sleepiness. And so something like that might be an option for you. Um, as far as like over the counter or herbal supplements, um, research doesn't support a lot of the different herbs and supplements that you see out there. So I say this with a huge caveat because I have a lot of sleep uh, patients that tell me, well, I take XYZ and it works really well for me. Great, as long as it doesn't hurt you and it's helping you, I don't see a problem with it. It's just there isn't research to say, this is the one you know, supplement that you need to take. The closest one out there is melatonin, um, and it's actually not super helpful for insomnia, but it could help you with the timing of your sleep. And so you could consider melatonin. Um, yeah, but I would stay away from, the one thing I'll say is uh, things like z uh, NyQuil, things like that. There's been some research to show that 
uh, consistent long-term antihistamine use uh, could have some negative consequences down the line. So even though it's over the counter, it doesn't necessarily mean it's something you should take every night, but you can definitely talk to your prescribing provider about any of that. We have a follow-up question about melatonin. Is there any danger in taking one milligram melatonin tablet two to three times a night? Oh, two to three times a night. Um, danger, so I, I got to throw this out. I'm not a prescribing provider, so this is all my off-the-cuff, just, you know, what I've seen in the clinic or heard from other providers, but um, I don't think there's any danger associated with it. It's mainly that it's likely not to be a super effective strategy. So it's better to take it earlier in the night, like one dose a couple hours before bed. Um, really by dosing yourself, you know, every couple of hours in the middle of the night, you're just going dis to, you're going to be producing melatonin into the morning, which might disrupt your schedule. Okay. Um, my SPO2 goes down to 80% and respirations go down to 10 per minute. Is this an issue? Um, so my question would be, how are you measuring that? Like, are you measuring it consistently throughout the night? Or are you taking your readings, you know, when you wake up? But either way, I would definitely talk to your provider about it. Primary care is a good place to start and just say like, or if you have a pulmonologist, which I know a lot of people do, that's also a great place. They're all trained in this. So I would probably think, I would think a sleep study might be helpful in that situation, but definitely, definitely talk to your provider about it. Okay. In your experience, have you had patients that make a clicking or knocking noise while sleeping? If so, is this indicative of sleep apnea? I'm trying to think of like clicking or knocking noise. Um, I haven't heard of that specifically, but I think anytime there's uh, like any any noises that could be like a gasping or, you know, it, it could definitely be attempts to take a breath. Um, you know, so I, I think it wouldn't hurt to ask, um, you know, if, if you're at risk for sleep apnea or if a sleep study might be helpful. Most insurances would cover it. So it's can't hurt. Okay. I take a five milligram gummy with melatonin every night. Is that too much? No, it's not. Uh, it's on the upper limit. So you see a lot of times uh, melatonin comes in really high doses, like 10, 15 milligrams. And the idea is the more, the better, the more it's going to help with sleep. And that's not necessarily the case. In fact, a lot of research with circadian issues shows that lower doses are often more helpful. So I try to say five or less, you know, sometimes as little as like one, two, three milligrams is all you need. So um, uh, five milligrams isn't too much, but it might be on the upper end of what you would need. Okay. Oh, and I should say uh, with melatonin, it's not necessarily that it's uh, going to be harmful to take higher doses. You know, in some situations, I'm sure it could be, but um what I've heard is it's more common just that it's it's not necessary. It doesn't do anything at higher doses. Okay. Uh, next question. Um, is it normal to have nightmares when taking melatonin? It can happen. Yeah. So if you're having nightmares and it's disrupting your sleep, you probably want to stop taking melatonin. I read that melatonin thins the blood. Is that true? Um, I haven't heard that, uh, and I haven't heard of providers recommending people not to take melatonin, but I'd check with your pharmacy. Like, if you have any blood thinning, if you have any issues and you wonder, is this okay for me? I think there's a common uh, misconception that if it's over the counter, it's safe for everyone, and it can't hurt to ask. If you don't want to ask your provider, your pharmacist um, is a very knowledgeable source of information. Okay. Um, any recommendations for those with GERD who must sleep at a steep angle and stay off their right side? I think it's so uncomfortable and it impedes sleep. Yep. Uh, I hear that a lot um, within the NPM community. And that's a hard one because it often, it, it takes time to retrain yourself and it might always be something that's not preferable. Um, but what I will say is if you're struggling and you're just frustrated, you're like at your wit's end, it's not working, you're wide awake, get out of bed, do that reset. Don't lay there uncomfortable trying to force your sleep. Um, 
you know, for a long extended period of time. You know, don't get out of bed the second you're uncomfortable, but you don't want to be laying there for an hour or two uncomfortable. You want to break that up. Otherwise, it's going to be more, you're just going to train yourself to be uncomfortable in bed, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, can you please talk a little about how to quiet an active mind? Yeah, so that's some of the, the things that I didn't get to just because of the, you know, I wanted to get to questions, but um, I would really encourage you to go back and listen to that other web webinar. Um, one of the things I recommend is creating this transition period. So, um, you know, not just going straight to bed at night, but doing something, uh, same thing every night that's going to help you start to unwind. It can start helping you decrease your arousal levels, lowering that um, cognitive arousal level. So uh, the other thing that you can do is called constructive worry. So um, just real quick, it's basically choosing a time in the day when you try to sit down and think about some of these things. So that if it's happening in the middle of the night, you can delay it to the next day. Um, a lot of times we have this active mind because a lot of this unfinished business is popping up in the middle of the night. And so the idea is a preemptive strike, try to get to it earlier in the day um, before it ever becomes an issue at night. Is there a difference with delayed melatonin or regular, I can fall asleep, but I can't stay asleep? Um, <laughs> so I would say the melatonin might not be as helpful with the staying asleep part. You can try the, the extended release version. Um, I think if you're consistently having trouble staying asleep, then it might be time to talk to someone about if you need like a sleep study, what's waking you up. Um, and again, if you're awake for those extended periods of time, getting out of bed, not trying to overcompensate with sleeping in, things like that might be more helpful than melatonin. Um, okay, next one. Uh, many of us with bronchiectasis and MAC have fatigue as a symptom. I often get very exhausted and can't stop myself from sleeping in the daytime, but I have no trouble sleeping at night. Any ideas? It's not a problem, you know, or it's not a problem from a sleep standpoint, I should say. Um, you know, it's, uh, so like I mentioned with, with um, illness, a lot of times you, your body needs more sleep. You, your, your cellular repair happens during sleep, immune health functioning, all of that's occurring during sleep. And so when you're sick, a lot of times you do need more sleep. So scheduling naps, if you can get away with it and you can still sleep at night, isn't necessarily a problem just from a purely sleep standpoint. You know, when it comes to disrupting your life, that might be another story. Um, but one way people can combat that is by doing a scheduled nap. So instead of, um, you know, just trying to fight off sleep or waiting to, you know, see if they need a nap, just scheduling a time every day when it's maybe least disruptive that you're going to lay down and you're going to try to rest. Um, particularly if it's not hurting your sleep at night. I, I will mention that we do have a, a webinar recording on our YouTube channel on managing fatigue. So that may also be helpful for anybody who wants to check that out. Um, yeah. We uh, don't have um, other um, questions in the queue right now. Okay. So I would like to just remind everybody that we have an upcoming webinar on December 13th. Again, with Dr. Smith, we have um, a, a webinar on rebuilding or building your confidence. And that'll be on December 13th at 6.30 p.m. EST, Eastern Standard. Um, I am not seeing, okay, so I think we've done, we're done. I think we've reached the end of the Q&A. Um, we're wrapping up right at seven uh, or at eight rather. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us uh, for another great webinar. Devin, thank you again for, for giving us another wonderful webinar, and we look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks. All right. Have, Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Have a good night, everybody.